I'm on a mission like a couple spies, and that guys is the reason why I catechize. Welcome to the Reform Standard. I'm Tony. Let's get started. Question three of the Westminster Larger Catechism reads, What is the Word of God? Answer, the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament are the Word of God, the only rule of faith and obedience. So at first blush, this question and answer seems really straightforward, and it is. Um, the Word of God is the Bible. So we're, we're not talking about uh, neo-Orthodoxy where the Word of God is contained in the Bible or the Bible becomes the Word of God when properly interpreted or properly experienced by the community. But the Word of God uh, is the Bible, and the Bible is the Word of God. That's not to say that God hasn't spoken uh, outside of the Bible prior to the close of the canon, right? We have Hebrews uh, chapter 1 that says, In former times God spoke to our fathers uh, in various ways by the prophets. Um, also, we see biblical testimony that there are prophets and prophetesses um, who engage their office but we're not recorded uh, what kinds of prophecies they made. You know, we think of like in the book of Acts, there's Agabus uh, who has this sort of enacted prophecy of binding his hands. But right before that, there's these uh, prophetesses who prophesy, but it doesn't say anything about what it is. So when we're talking about the word of God uh, contained in the New Testament, as the, the shorter catechism says in the Old Testament, really what we're talking about is the inscripturated revelation of God. And it's important to tie this to the um, the different proof texts that uh, the divines and, in my edition, the, the OPC provide. And, you know, it's it's not surprising that they cite 2 Timothy 3.16, which says all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for all very uh, various uh, uses, teaching, correction, reproof, uh, equipping the saints for righteousness, etc., but then probably more um, more important or more uh, specific is their citation of 2 Peter 1, 19-21, which reads, We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do, do, do well that ye take heed in your hearts, uh, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but by the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So what, what the divines are trying to land here, and, and the important part to remember, is that the scriptures are not the words of men. Now, it's true that they are the words of men in that they were written by men, the Holy Spirit, um, you know, we don't generally affirm a dictation theory. The Holy Spirit didn't take over uh, the minds uh, and, uh, and faculties of the writers of Scripture. But they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, um, you know, I, th I think it was Gerhardus Voss that, that said more or less that um, when God wanted to inspire a letter uh, written by a man like Paul, he providentially brought about a Paul to write that. Um, we also don't affirm some sort of mechanical dictation in which, like, the human instrument somehow is controlled, you know, like automatic writing or something like that. So what we really believe is that the Holy Spirit providentially ordered men to write exactly what he intended. Um, not, not just in the concepts, but in the very words and grammar itself. So it's important for us to remember that the Word of God is the Old and New Testament. Um, it's not as though, you know, the, the concepts are there, but the actual words that the Holy Spirit inspired. And I think, you know, as I read this, this passage in Peter, it's important to remember that immediately prior to this, he talks about his own experience with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, and when he says, we have a more certain word, that's what he's referring to. So sometimes I think we turn, um, we turn to our experience or we're tempted to uh, turn to our experience in terms of understanding who God is and what, what he does and how he relates to us. We trust our feelings. We trust the anecdotes that we hear from people from other churches. Um, even those of us who are cessationists, sometimes we have this tendency to want something more than the word of God. But Peter, who um, had amazing experiences with Christ, 
right? He was there when Christ walked on the water. He walked on the water himself. Um, he was there when the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost. He was there when when Jesus um, provided the miraculous loaves. He was there when Jesus um, provided the miraculous catches of fishes. Um, he was there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. And even with all of those amazing experiences, with the Logos himself, right, a, a real genuine experience with the incarnate Word of God, he trusts the inscripturated Word of God more than his own recollection of uh, the incarnate Word of God. And so we should never feel as though we are somehow um, deficient or that our experience can't, um, can't compare, because if we take Peter seriously— what he says is that um, the, the prophecies of the scripture are not a matter of private interpretation. Even his experience is not as certain to him as the words of Holy Scripture which had been handed down to him. And that's a really glorious gift that we've been given by the Holy Spirit. That we have a certain and sure word that is not a matter of private interpretation, but is a matter of the Holy Spirit moving through men to provide us exactly the revelation that he intended. Do you know if you want you could know this? The catechism, hey, the catechism, hey. Do you know what the chief and the man is? And how the father, son, and spirit do manage? Do you know if you want you could know this? West Side.